Hey, Life Group Leaders, hope you're doing well today. That's Pastor Adam. Um, we are going to be in John chapter 18, verses 28 through 40 this week. Before we jump in and read those verses, I want to talk to you about a little bit of background. Um, we, we missed some verses from what you did last week um, into this week. Um, so last week in the opening of chapter 18, what we learned about Judas betraying Jesus, uh, Peter's denial of Jesus. And so while those verses aren't covered in this week, you can see uh, that context in, in your passage. I think it's good um, to make sure that you don't miss those for your class so that they can uh, understand the context of what you're going to be doing today. So I want to read these verses to you, and then I want to talk about some application, uh, some discussion ideas that you can do as a class, and I think that would be a great help. So let, let's first read John 18, 28 through 40. So Jesus is, is before Pilate, and the scripture says this, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So pause for a second there. So Jesus said that he would die by being uh, lifted high. He would die by being lifted up. If the Jews killed him, he more than likely would have been stoned to death. So this is just another example that reminds us that Jesus is really in control of this whole situation. So uh, moving on to verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, called to Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or do others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside of the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man but Barabbas. No, Barabbas was a robber. Let's spend a minute and pray uh, before we go in to our, our points on our lesson. Uh, God, I pray and ask that you would uh, reveal your, your truth to us. Um, God, as people of the truth, God, I pray, Lord, that we uh, boldly and with confidence um, speak and teach your lesson this week. God, as we talk about who you are, Lord, what your kingdom is, and what it looks like to follow you, um, God, I pray that you would help us uh, examine our lives and uh, find ways that we can uh, increase our walk with you and to better follow you in every area of our life. Lord, I thank you for these teachers. I thank you for their, their diligence in studying, and I pray that you would uh, bless their efforts this week. We love you, God, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So an, an introduction. So the first, there are the, the people in this passage. So we've got uh, Jews, we, we've got Romans, and one thing to understand when you're learning about what the Jews are trying to do and what the Romans are trying to do is that these were not the same people, these were not the same camps, but both of them primarily were interested in making sure that nothing rose up that was going to take their power away. So they were really paranoid about groups, people um, rising up in power that they may overthrow the government. The Jews definitely did not want that to happen. So one, uh, the people in this passage are the, the Jewish leaders. So there are current Jewish leaders, uh, former Jewish leaders uh, in play. So one was um, Annas. Annas was actually no longer officially the high priest, but you know you have official leaders and you have unofficial leaders. Maybe you've seen this in your workplace. You've seen this in a church. 
Um, so he didn't officially have the, the title anymore, but he was revered and people followed him. He was still a leader. And then you have Caiaphas, who was the official leader at the time, and he was needed to be able to bring Jesus from the Jews to the Romans. They needed um, an official person currently in office to deliver people over to the Romans to do uh, what they wanted to do. Um, also, one thing to know, uh, just a little background, that the Jews say um, in the passage that we read about that they can't put people to death. They actually could um, before Rome had overtaken Judea around 86. And um, so the Romans took that ability away. And uh, they, the Romans really held that um, over people's heads that they were the ones that held the power um, to take someone's life for them. So then we have the Roman official Pilate. Pilate was, seemed like a, a, an insecure leader. Um, he displayed a lot of violence towards the Jews. Um, and he was actually eventually fired finally uh, years later. He was in his post for about 11 years um, th that we know about before he was fired. And then, of course, we have Jesus. Uh, Jesus expounds in this passage on his kingdom, of uh, what truth is, and why he is, he is here. So um, I mentioned earlier about the context. So for me, an easier way to look at this passage, it's a little bit differently than it's laid out in your book, um, is to look at this as there were two trials. There was a, a Jewish trial and a Roman trial. So first, in the, the Jewish trial, the Jewish leaders accuse Jesus of blasphemy, and they decide... Um, that Jesus' death is needed. It's not just a scourging. Um, it's not just a, a rebuke that he has to die. It's the only way to make sure that he is not going to create a, a revolution and um, create an overthrow of power for them. So Jesus is, is brought before Pilate now. Okay, there's a, a, a Roman trial. Pilate, the, the Roman governor, as I said, the Jews didn't have the ability to execute him, so they needed Rome to carry out their wishes. So Pilate questions Jesus, but he ultimately finds no fault in them. Now, one place of application as at, in the opening uh, of this passage that's quite ironic in, in verse 28, uh, we see that the Jews uh, were careful not to defile themselves before the Passover. They used caution to not enter the governor's headquarters. You see, there are um, oral traditions that were passed down from generation to, to generation. Um, things got added to the law over time. Um, if you've studied much about this, you know that uh, by the time Jesus is on the scene, uh, there are so many laws that, that were created um, that weren't from God, but they were held in that same esteem. They held them to that same level. And so, they had uh, this, this oral law that they couldn't enter the dwelling of a Gentile. If they did that, it would mean that they couldn't participate in, in the Passover. So imagine these Jewish leaders taking the Messiah to be killed, yet uh, we need to be careful because we don't want to uh, break uh, an oral tradition in the Mishnah and be unclean so we can't participate in the Passover. So uh, that's a, a big <laughs> hypocrisy, uh, a, a hypocritic legalism there. So they were denying Jesus. They were seeking to um, kill him. They had arrested him, yet they chose to keep their, their man-made rules. So as a lot to do in these videos, here's a point of discussion for you. Um, you could write this on the whiteboard. Uh, you could just talk about it. So here's a question that you could ask your group. What are some areas of our lives where we feel righteous by keeping rules, but we fail to glorify God? Okay, ask your class, what are some man-made rules, be them religious or not, that, that we create an, an opportunity to be a hypocrite? And maybe ask for the, the top three. Sometimes if you put a number with it, you'll get more reactions. So say, what are, are the top three ways in your life, um, in life in general, that you see people be hypocrites, that you see them doing things that don't make sense. So there's a, an application opportunity. So there's two trials, the Jewish and the Roman, and then there's Jesus' kingdom. So Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom um, is not of this world. So this means that his, his kingdom was not political, it's not military. And what this should communicate to Pilate is that uh, I'm not starting a revolution to throw you out of office. I'm not a threat to Rome. My kingdom um, is not of this world. It is a, a spiritual kingdom. And so the kingdom of God, um, it is real, but it's not all the way here yet, okay? 
it's true, but it's not fully here now. And that's what Jesus um, is trying to explain to Pilate. And as we see later, Pilate says, I find no fault in this man. He's, I don't think that he's a, a threat um, to you um, or, or to Rome. He said, I find no fault in him. And then Jesus, in addition to his kingdom, he talks about truth. Jesus said that everyone who belongs to him hears his voice and they understand the truth. So another point of application, how does a correct understanding of Jesus' kingdom, okay, the kingdom of God, impact our lives and decisions today? How does Jesus' kingdom maybe change the way you view life? Um, maybe it's in the way you handle money. Maybe it's in the way you vote, okay? How does that impact your life? So another discussion um, opportunity there. How should a proper understanding of the kingdom of God impact your life? Does it give you more hope or less? So again, this is a chance you could write on the board, you could do a paper, you could even break up in, into some groups if you want to. Five, ten minutes, have groups discuss it, come back and talk about that as a large group. How does a proper understanding of the kingdom of God impact your life in your daily decisions? Now, I would hope that people would come back and say, you know, if I really understand what the kingdom of God is, it changes the way that I think about money. It changes the way I treat my spouse. It changes the way I treat my kids. It changes the way I, I work um, in my employment. It changes the way um, I vote. It, it should impact every area of our lives, um, but we probably don't wake up every morning talking about these things. So this is a great opportunity to talk about that. And at, at the end of the day, if God's kingdom, if God's glory, if his plan is driving us and driving all of our daily decisions, um, we should probably find areas in our lives where we can make changes. So make that a point of discussion and application. So there, there are two trials. Jesus talks about his kingdom. Jesus talks about the truth and why he's here. And then we have Pilate's response. Okay, so Pilate is confused by Jesus' words. We see that in, in verse 37. He's like, so um, are you the king? What What is what is truth? He asked in 38, in that first part, 38a, if you will. He says, what, what is truth? And it, it, it would be amazing to be a fly on the wall to have Pilate there and Jesus there, who is truth, the foundation of truth, all truth, speaking truth. And here's Pilate saying, oh, what is truth? And so a theme you may be seeing in this video is application and discussion. So here's another point. Think about this. Pilate, blinded by sin, speaking with the foundation of truth, the creator of the world, cannot clearly see what is before him. Uh, is it not amazing that even when Jesus is present in the flesh, people don't grasp who he is and what he represents? Now, we see this throughout the Gospels. At times, you'll be reading through the Gospels, and you'll read about the disciples doing things um, on the boat, miracles Jesus does. People, who is this man? Who Who is this man that, that the waves obey him? Who is he that he can do all these miracles? He's right in front of them, and yet they don't see it. Well, there's a few reasons they don't see it. For one, it's not God's timing for them to see it um, because he's at work in this whole situation to bring about um, the fulfillment of his plan. Also, by Pilate, um, in addition to that, he's, he, he's blinded by sin. Um, he can't see what is before him. Discussion opportunity again. Does this still happen today? So here's something to ask yourself as a teacher. Here's something to ask yourself to your class. Explain, ask the question, what are, when are times that God clearly makes himself known, yet we don't see him? We end up denying him and his truth. Maybe it's when you're reading the Bible and his truth is clearly in front of you, yet you're not obedient to do what he tells you to do. Maybe you've prayed and asked him for guidance about something in your life, and he's given you guidance and clearly shown you what you should be doing, uh, but yet you deny that truth and you, you deny who he is by being disobedient. So going on from the application uh, Pilate has said again that he found no guilt in Jesus, and he eventually releases uh, Barabbas. He, he goes on to have Jesus scourged, and uh, most commentators say that he was hoping that the scourging would be enough and the Jews would let him go. He didn't want Jesus' blood on his hands, but of course we know how, how the story ends. They end up crucifying Jesus. So 
in conclusion, Jesus' arrest, I mean, his trials, his words, remind us, one, that we can be hypocrites so easily. Um, I, I can't imagine uh, Peter or different people walking with Jesus, seeing the miracles, denying him, uh, being hypocrites, doing wrong things. I, I can't imagine that that doesn't happen in your life because I know that it happens in my life. So he, here's a challenge to your class this week. Ask them to spend time in reflection. And the question they need to ask themselves themselves are this, what are my blind spots? How am I being a hypocrite? How am I missing Jesus? How am I missing his truth? How are my actions not consistent with carrying his kingdom forward and being a representative for him now? What are our blind spots? How are you missing Jesus and his truth? And then once they're identified, what are you going to do about it? Kind of that, so what question. Okay, we talked about all this stuff, so what are we going to do now? And challenge your class to think about that and give them a little homework to write those things down and then have them come back next week and talk about them. And then pray. Pray in class and ask them to pray um, over the next week, asking God to reveal to them areas in their lives um, where they're not, their walk is not matching up with their talk. So, uh, I hope these points have been good. I hope it gives you some ideas to, to teach the lesson. Um, there's a lot of other great material in your book. There's a lot of other great resources out there. Um, if you're ever having trouble with a passage, I can help you. I would love to do that. It would be uh, my most favorite conversation of the week, um, short of sharing the gospel with somebody. So feel free to reach out. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for leading, shepherding, and teaching your group well. Um, you are the heartbeat of this church, and uh, this church cannot move forward without you. We thank you for your service. I'm going to be praying for you. I hope you have a good day. Thanks for watching.